Good. Let's get going. Question number 11 on practice midterm one of chemistry 1401. It says here a compound has the general formula G2A5. A sample of this compound has a mass of 10 grams and contains 5.64 grams of A. Determine the ratio of molar masses of the two elements. Well, if I have 10.00 grams of my compound of G2A5, okay, and it has it has five or contains 5.64 grams of A, then I know the mass, the mass in grams of B is going to be what's left over. So I take 10.00 grams and I subtract 5.64 grams and I end up with 4.36 grams of G. Did I say B when I should have, should have said G? Let me fix that there. Let me fix that here. There we go. So that's the mass of G. So now we have the mass of A in that compound, and we have the mass of G. And from that, we can figure out the ratio of their molar masses. How would I do that? Well, I know that if I have 4.63 grams, of G, if I have 4.63 grams of this, I know that I have it in two moles, right? So I'll put, divide that by two moles, and I know that I have 5.64 grams, okay, in the same compound for every five moles, right? Because I have a two to five ratio of G to A in this compound. And so when I do that, I'm going to work out the math below here, and I'll say I have a ratio of 4.36 grams divided by two moles for every 5.64 grams of A for every five moles like that, that reduces to 2.18 moles of G per 1.13 moles of A. And when you divide that, you get a ratio of 1.9. I got 1.93, which is close enough to 1.94. So that's the answer. So that's how we figured that one out. Let's move on to question 12. It says, uh, you do a combustion analysis of a one gram sample of a hydrocarbon. It contains only the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And you end up with 1.500 grams of CO2 and 4 0.409 grams of water. Determine the empirical formula of the compound. Well, this one takes quite a bit of crunching here in terms of our math, but um, not nothing new here, right? The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to figure out the mass of carbon in the 1.500 grams of CO2. How are we going to do that? We're going to multiply that by the mass percent of carbon in CO2, right? So if I want the mass of carbon in the CO2. I know that in one mole of CO2, which weighs 44.01 grams per mole, there is only one carbon atom, which weighs 12.01 grams per mole, right? And I'm going to multiply that by the mass of the carbon, which is 1.500 grams. And when I do that, I end up with zero point, so it should have four sig figs, 0 0.4093 grams of carbon. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my water. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna figure out the mass of hydrogen. Because if I figure out the mass of carbon and the mass of hydrogen, I know the total mass is one, so I can subtract both of those to figure out the mass of the oxygen. So let's figure out the mass, mass of hydrogen is going to be equal to the mass of the two moles of hydrogen, which is two times 1.01 grams per mole, okay, divided by the mass of water, which is 18.01 grams per mole. When you punch all that spinach into your calculator and multiply it by the mass 0 0.409, you end up with the mass of hydrogen in that water, right? We're just using percent mass of an element in a compound. We've done this several times in this class, and you end up with 0 0.0456 grams of hydrogen. Now I know the total mass of carbon, and I know the total mass of hydrogen. Well, according to the law of conservation of mass, 
if both of these came from the 1.00 grams, what's going to be left over? It's going to be the mass of oxygen, right? And so to figure out the mass of my oxygen, I'll say the mass, oops, I'll say the mass, mass of oxygen is going to be equal to 1.00 grams, subtract 0 0.4093 grams, subtract 0 0.0456 grams. And when you do that, you end up with 0 0.5451 grams of oxygen. So now I have the masses of my carbon, my hydrogen, and my oxygen. Now I need to figure out the empirical formula. Well, the good news is I know the molar masses of all of these elements, and I can divide each one of these by the, their molar masses. So if I divide this by 12.01 grams per mole, if I divide this by 1.01 grams per mole, and if I divide this by 16.00 grams per mole, all obtained from the periodic table, I get a ratio. I'm going to write this, or I'm going to write the number of moles in blue ink, just so you can kind of stick with me here because I'm kind of running out of space. You end up with 0 0.03410 moles of carbon. You end up with 0 0.0451 moles of hydrogen, and you end up with 0 0.03407 moles of oxygen. What's the first thing that Mr. Dion notices is that these two numbers are practically identical. And so the carbon and the oxygen are present in a one to one ratio. What's the ratio of carbon or oxygen to hydrogen? Well, let's figure that out. We can say we know that we have 0 0.03410 moles of carbon. We divide that by our 0, 0.0. Um, oh, no, I want to put the smaller number in the denominator. Oops. There we go, 0 0.0451 moles of hydrogen. We'll divide that by 0 0.034. On zero moles of carbon. And that's just to figure out our ratio. You punch that in your calculator, you get 1.3. 1.3 isn't a whole number, but if we multiply that by three, we get approximately four. And so we have a one to one ratio of carbon to oxygen, but we have a one to four ratio of, or sorry, we multiply, yeah, so we have a three to four ratio, right? Because we multiplied everything by three. And then we end up with four. And so the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen must be three carbons, four hydrogens, and three oxygens. And if you're like, what are you, what are you doing there at the end? What I'm doing is I'm just finding the lowest possible whole numbers that I can relate these molar quantities to. So it'd be three and four and three. Okay. Now when I did that problem, because we did a problem almost identical to this in class, okay, earlier on, it was the one that I showed the combustion chamber. So if you wanna go back and look at that problem, you can see the whole worked out solution in even more detail than this. But what we did in that question is that we divided each one of these molar quantities by the lowest possible, or the lowest molar quantity, right? So you divide each one of them by 0 0.03410, and then you figure out the, the closest whole number ratio. So that's all I did at the end. All right, let's move on from there. Question 13 says, how many grams of sodium iodide are present in 13 or 17.53 milliliters of a 1.15 molar aqueous sodium iodide solution? The first thing that I want to cover with you here is what is molarity? It's the number of moles per liter, right? So we have our volume given to us in milliliters. If we want to convert that into liters, we simply divide by a thousand milliliters per liter, and we would end up with a volume equal to 0 0.01753 liters. And you might be wondering, well, why did you do that first, Mr. Dion? Because I want you to see that we have liters and we have moles per liter. If we multiply that together, we would have what? The number of moles of sodium iodide, but we want the number of grams. What are we going to have to do? We're going to have to use the molar mass of sodium iodide which I've already gone ahead and looked up. The molar mass of sodium iodide, which is NaI, is 149.89 grams, okay? Grams per 
mole like that. So with that in mind, now we can set up the whole entire problem using dimensional analysis. And if you're wondering, well, how can you do that? Well, we know that we have 0 0.01753 liters of sodium iodide, and we know the concentration of our sodium iodide is 1.15 moles of sodium iodide in one liter of sodium iodide. If we were to stop right here, we would end up with the number of moles, but we need the number of grams. So we've got one more conversion factor to insert. And the good news is, is that we know the molar mass of sodium iodide, which is 149.89 grams of sodium iodide in one mole of sodium iodide like that. Looky, looky, moles of sodium iodide cancel out. And I'm left with the mass of sodium iodide, which is 3.02 grams of sodium iodide. And so that is this answer right here. And there you have it, folks. All right. Let me click that. There you go. Give me a thumbs up if you think you could nail this one. I don't like to use the word simple in chemistry in the same sentence, but this is one of those problems that you should be able to work out with relative ease. Okay. Relative ease. I'm not saying that you have to be able to, you know, I meet you on the street in two years and you, I'm going to ask you this question. No, but, you, you know, right now you should be able to solve a problem like that with relative ease. Okay. Um, this is a dilution problem. It says how many milliliters of a 3.38 molar sucrose solution, here's the formula of sucrose, are required to prepare 250 milliliters of a point, or 0 0.228 molar solution, right? We're going from something that is, from something that is more concentrated, more concentrated, and we want to make something that's less concentrated, right? Less concentrated. Okay, so for this, we're going to use the dilution formula, which is M1V1 is equal to M2, M2, V2. And what we're looking for is the milliliters, okay? So we know our original molarity is 3.38 molar. We know that the molarity we want to end up with is 0 0.228 molar. We also know the volume we wish to obtain which is 250.00 milliliters. What we're looking for is the volume of that stock solution that we have to use, so that we have to take out and dilute. So now we need to isolate V1 from this formula, and you should be able to do that. You should be able to say V1 is equal to M2 times V2 divided by M1. Then we just plug in our numbers. So we have 0 0.228 molar is our final concentration. We have 250 milliliters as our final volume. And we have our initial concentration as being 3.38 moles per liter or molar. Look at this. Molarity cancels out. So I'm sure that there was somebody who's listening to me and saying, you know, Mr. Dion, why didn't you convert this into liters? You did in the last problem. I don't have to in this problem. Because all of my answers are given in milliliters. And when I set this up, molarity cancels out. So I'm left over with milliliters anyway. And thus, when I punch all this spinach into my calculator, I get that my final volume is 16.9 milliliters with three sig figs. Because we only have three sig figs here and here in our concentration. There we go. 16.9 milliliters. Question number 15 says ammonia is sold as an aqueous solution that's 28% ammonia by mass and has a density of 0 0.90 grams per milliliter at 20 degrees Celsius. What's the molarity of this commercial solution? Well, remember, if we want the molarity of ammonia, what we want is the concentration of ammonia. And that's going to equal the number of moles of ammonia divided by the volume of ammonia. Now, something that you have to know is that if something is 28% by mass, that means that in 100 grams of the solution that you buy, 28 grams of it is ammonia. Okay. Could we figure out the number of moles in, a gr in, in that 100 grams? Sure we can. Yeah, sure we can. If we multiply this by the molar mass of ammonia. Now, I've already gone ahead and looked that up. 
that the molar mass of ammonia is 17.0 grams per mole. And we can use that conversion factor right here. Let me show you. If I plug in 17.0 grams of ammonia in one mole of ammonia, then I would know the number of moles of ammonia that I have in that 100 grams. Okay, so now I have the moles per gram. Well, I want the number of moles per liter. Hmm, where am I going to get that conversion factor? Well, goody, goody, they've given me the density in grams per milliliter. I can convert that into grams per liter, no problem. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that density as a conversion factor. I know that I have 0 0.90 grams of my ammonia in one liter. Sorry. I'm getting confused. In one milliliter of my ammonia, like that. Okay. And I know that there are a thousand milliliters in one liter. Looky, looky. Look at this beautiful math. You see that we end up with our grams of solution canceling out. We have our milliliters canceling out, like that. And we end up with the number of moles of ammonia per liter of ammonia like that. That gives us the concentration. So when we work all that spinach out in our calculator, we end up with 15.0 molar solution of ammonia. Okay. I don't know why. And I shouldn't say, I shouldn't even phrase it that way. That doesn't sound very nice. But for some reason, this problem will trip students up once in a while. So make sure you take, if you're like, I'm not 100% sure where I got, you know, how it put all these conversion factors together, be sure to take a look at it before the final, or before the midterm, sorry, and before the final. Okay, here's one of those limiting reactant problems that normally takes up a lot of space. And so let's just take a quick peek here. It says iron 2 hydroxide is formed by the reaction of iron 2 chloride and lithium hydroxide, according to the chemical equation shown below. How many grams of iron 2 hydroxide, that's this guy, will be produced if 16.62 mils of 0.444 molar iron 2 chloride are reacted with 73.8 mils of 0.1 molar aqueous lithium hydroxide? Well, this is a limiting reactant problem. We have to determine which one of these is the limiting reactant. Is it iron 2 chloride or is it lithium hydroxide? Which one of these would produce the least number of moles? of iron 2 hydroxide. You know what? Just because I don't want to run into space, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to use a blank slate here and I'll write out the formula or the not formula. I'm going to write out the reaction. All right, so let's write out the reaction. So we have iron 2 chloride. I'm going to leave out the states of matter just for the interest of time. There we go. Plus lithium hydroxide. We end up with iron 2 hydroxide. And we end up with lithium chloride. It's a balanced equation. I'm just going to move this over a little bit so I have some more space. So the first thing we'll do is we'll figure out the number of moles of iron 2 hydroxide that are produced from iron 2 chloride. And our iron 2 chloride, we know that we have 0 0.01662 liters of FeCl2. Again, I just divided it by 1,000 multiplied by 0 0.444 moles of FeCl2 in one mole of FeCl2. From our balanced equation, we know that for every one mole of FeCl2, we produce one mole of iron 2 hydroxide, like that. Look at this, liter, or sorry, did I put moles? Per, did I put moles per mole? Yeah, I think Mr. Dion might be going a little too fast. I'm going to slow down a little bit here. There we go. There we go. All right, so that gives us the number of moles of iron 2 hydroxide that would be produced. I'll put that in here. It's 0. Um, 0. 0.00738 moles of iron 2 hydroxide that you would make. Okay. Now let's do the exact same exercise with our lithium hydroxide. And I'm going to divide 
by a thousand, or yeah, by, uh, so I have 0 0.0738 liters multiplied by zero liters of lithium hydroxide multiplied by 0 0.100 moles of lithium hydroxide in one liter of lithium hydroxide. Then I know that for every two moles of lithium hydroxide that are consumed, I produce one mole of iron two hydroxide, like that. I punch all that spinach in, look, liters cancel out, moles cancel out, and I end up with how many moles? I end up with 0 0.00369 moles of iron two hydroxide. Oh, good gravy, that's definitely a lower number, right? This is definitely a smaller number. And so that tells us that lithium hydroxide is the limiting reactant like that. Now it's asking us for the mass of um, lithium hydroxide, or asking us for the mass of iron two hydroxide that's formed. And we know that we're gonna end up with 0 0.00369 moles. And now I can take that number Okay, I can take this number. Ah, that didn't work, did it? I'll just rewrite it. I have 0 0.00369 moles of iron 2 hydroxide, and I multiply that by the molar mass of iron 2 hydroxide. I went and figured that out already. It's 89.86 grams of iron 2 hydroxide in one mole of iron 2 hydroxide. Look at this. Look at this beauty. Moles of iron 2 hydroxide cancel out, and I end up with my final mass of iron 2 hydroxide, which is 0 0.331 grams of iron 2 hydroxide, and that is the final answer. That better be one of the answers that's in here. Um, Mr. Dion's in trouble. Is it? There we go. All right. Perfect. Okay. One of the answers. Give me a thumbs up if you're like, I've practiced, lift, uh, I've practiced limiting reaction, so many limiting reactant problems so many times I could do it in my sleep. All right. Great. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Excellent. Good. Well, here's another one for you. Okay. It says here the reaction of sodium phosphate with barium chloride produces sodium nitrate and barium phosphate according to this beautiful balanced equation. How many moles of barium phosphate are we gonna form when we react 35 mils of 0.3 molar sodium phosphate with 25 mils of 0.45 barium, molar barium chloride assuming 100% yield? Um, it looks like I'm missing an answer here, doesn't it? Anyhow, let me double check. Um, Well, the good news is that the answer is in one of these three. Okay. So anyhow, I'm missing the answers here. But anyhow, you know what? Let's try to work it out all on one slide. Just in the interest of, you know, maybe keeping things simplified. So we'll start out with our sodium phosphate. I'm going to do the sodium phosphate math up here. And I'm going to divide these volumes by 1,000. Can you divide 35 by 1,000? Can you divide 25 by 1,000 in your head? Okay, well, if you can do that, follow along with me. So for our sodium phosphate, we have 0 0.0350 liters times 0 0.300 moles per liter, like that. We know that for every... two moles of sodium phosphate, that's consumed, we end up producing one mole of barium phosphate, like that. I should have put liters of sodium phosphate here. I'll just put it in at the top here. Uh, won't let me right up there. Anyhow, and then you can see that these units cancel out. Liters of sodium phosphate. No, I should have put moles of sodium phosphate. 
Try it again. Moles of sodium phosphate Na3PO4. There we go. That's better. So I cancel those out, and I end up with the number of moles of barium phosphate as being 0 0.00525 moles of barium phosphate. Good. So I've done it for my first reactant. Now I'm going to do it the exact same exercise. I'm going to do it for the barium chloride. So we'll do that down here. I'm starting out with 0 0.0250 liters. And I know that I have 0 0.450 moles of barium chloride in one liter. I know that for every three moles of barium chloride that get consumed, I form one mole of barium phosphate. Like that. Looky looky. Moles of barium chloride cancel out. And I get the number of moles of barium phosphate, which is 0.00377 moles of barium phosphate. There we go. And that is going to be the limiting reactant, right? Our barium chloride, right? BACL2, is limiting reactant. And it's asking us what's the number of moles of barium phosphate that would be formed. And since 0 0.00377 is a smaller number than this one here. That tells us that, again, barium chloride is our limiting reactant, and that's the total number of moles. This is close enough, 0 0.00375, like that. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Titration problem. It says here by titration, it's found that 24.56 mils of 3 molar sulfuric acid are required to neutralize 20 mils of sodium hydroxide. Calculate the concentration of the sodium hydroxide aqueous solution. We have an unbalanced equation, but we can balance this out, okay? Because we have two sodiums here, so we're going to need a two here. Then we have a total of four hydrogens, so we need a four here. And we have eight oxygens. No. Uh, no, sorry. And then a two here. There we go. Now we have a balanced equation. So it should be H2SO4 plus two sodium hydroxides gives us two water molecules plus <clears throat> sodium sulfate. There you have it. So what are we starting out with? We're starting out with 0 0.0246 liters of sulfuric acid and we know the concentration of our of our sulfuric acid is 0 0.300 moles of sulfuric acid in one liter of sulfuric acid we know from our balanced equation the ratio of sulfuric acid to sodium hydroxide is one to two we again so we know that for every one mole of sulfuric acid that gets consumed we consume two moles of sodium hydroxide. And when we do all that math, what do we end up with? We end up with the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And so that is equal to 0 0.0, no, 0 0.0148 moles of NaOH. How do we determine concentration? What's concentration? Well, concentration, concentration of sodium hydroxide is simply the number of moles of sodium hydroxide divided by the volume of sodium hydroxide. We know the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.0148 moles, and we know the volume of sodium hydroxide. They told us right here that it's 20 milliliters. I'm gonna divide that by 1,000 in my head, which is 0 0.0200 liters, and that is gonna give me my final concentration, which is 0.738 molar sodium hydroxide. And so there is my final answer. Titration problem. Next question, question 19 says, the aluminum in a 5.32 gram sample of impure aluminum, so that means it's some aluminum and then some other, um, other elements that are found in there, requires 353 milliliters 
of 1.50 molar nitric acid for complete reaction according to the chemical equation shown below. And it's balanced for us. Determine the mass percent of aluminum in the sample. Well, mass percent, and we've already looked at mass percent in the first problem of the day, I think, but mass percent of aluminum, mass percent of aluminum is just going to be equal to the mass of of aluminum by divided by the mass of the sample, which is 5.32 grams, multiplied by 100%. That's all we need to do. So that means we already know the mass of the sample. It's right here. Then what do we need to do? We need to figure out what's the mass of aluminum. How are we going to do that? We know the amount of nitric acid that it takes to react, and we have a balanced equation. We know the ratio of nitric acid to aluminum. So let's get cracking. All right, we know that we have zero point, oops, we have this, I'm gonna divide by a thousand. So we have 0 0.353 liters of nitric acid. And we know that we have 1.50 moles of nitric acid in one liter of nitric acid. If we were to stop here, we'd end up with the number of moles of nitric acid. But we can get from our balanced equation that for every six moles of nitric acid that's consumed, we consume two moles of aluminum. If we were to stop here, we'd have the number of moles of aluminum, but we need the mass of aluminum. And so we can use the molar mass of aluminum, which we get from the periodic table. And it is 26.98 grams of aluminum in one mole of aluminum, like that. This cancels out, and we end up with the mass of aluminum, which is equal to 4.76 grams of aluminum. Now we just calculate the mass percent. So mass percent of aluminum is equal to 4.76 grams divided by my 5.32 grams and I multiply that whole thing by 100 percent and I get 89.5 percent like that. There we have it. Question number 20 says which statement about a chemical equation is true? There's some real wacky statements in here. I looked at these before class. A chemical equation shows the actual amount of products. Good gravy. How many times do we have to say no? No, it shows you the amount of products in moles, but it doesn't show you the actual amount of products. Okay, it shows you the moles of products. Um, a balanced a chemical equation shows only elements in the reactants and products, not the number of atoms. Well, that's definitely untrue. If you have CO2, it doesn't just say CO. If you have water, it doesn't just say HO. It tells you that it's, you know, CO2 or H2O, so that's not true. The next one says, a chemical equation is a representation of a chemical reaction. Well, of course that's true. That's what we use an equation for, is to show us what happens in a reaction. The next one's kind of funny. A chemical reaction is a representation of a chemical reaction. Well, that's kind of turning things backwards. And the last one says, a chemical equation shows the actual amount of reactants available to perform a chemical reaction? Well, of course not. You'd have to, no, not even close, okay? You'd have to figure out how many, uh, how much was used. This is an artifact from me um, planning on making a part three, which I never got around to doing. Okay, let's take a look at question 21. Uh, it says here, you take iron three oxide, so Fe2O3, you react it with carbon monoxide to form metallic iron and CO2. When the chemical equation corresponding to this reaction is balanced to the lowest possible whole number ratio of the balancing coefficients, the coefficient of iron is. Okay, so this is this question kind of involves some nomenclature to me. A little bit of nomenclature. Okay, so we're starting with iron three oxide. Okay, and it says it reacts with carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a covalent compound. It's made from two non-metals. So we're going to have CO like that. It says here to form metallic iron. What's metallic iron? It's just plain old iron. It's just plain old 
Fe. And what's carbon dioxide? Just plain old CO2. So we end up making iron and we end up making CO2. Now it says to balance this using a whole number ratio of coefficients. Let me give you a tip. Whenever you have an element by itself, you always save for last because you can do whatever the heck you want with that coefficient. Not limited. So we'll start with carbon. Carbon is balanced on both sides. On this side, I have a total of one, two, three, four oxygens. But on this side, I only have two. And so that tells me that I should have at least a two in front of there. But that's not going to work. Okay. That's not going to work, I don't think. Because if I put two there, then I've got to put a two there. No, that won't work. Okay. Does anybody have an idea of where I can start with this one? I'm just kind of thinking about it while I'm yammering on to you guys. Anybody have an idea where you might want to start here? Somebody put a three in front of the carbon monoxide. Yeah, I think it's probably a good place to start. Yeah, you could start there. Or you could even, I mean, you could even balance the iron out first. I like to always save those things for last, but you could do that. Okay, yeah. So somebody says if they put a three in front of here, then you have a three in front of here like this, right? Because you have to have the carbons balanced like that. But now your oxygens are balanced. You have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six oxygens here, and you have a total of six oxygens here as well. Okay, so you get six oxygens on both sides, you got three carbons on both sides, but the iron is not balanced out. And so you would put a two in front of the iron like that. So now the iron is balanced, and the coefficient in front of it is the number two, like that. All right, let's keep moving. It says lithium metal reacts with water to form lithium hydroxide as one of the products. So let's write that down. We've got lithium hydroxide. And it says calcium metal reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide. To form calcium hydroxide. And there's the formula. What's the most likely reaction between barium and water? Well, who's got an idea? Which group is barium found in? Does anybody know which group barium is found in? Yeah, it's found in group two, right? Lithium is a group, a group 1A metal. It likes to have a charge of plus one. Okay. Calcium is a group, group 2A metal. It likes to have a charge of plus two, which makes sense because hydroxide has a charge of minus one. And here you'd need to have OH minus, and you'd have to have two of them, right? To have minus two to balance out your plus two. Okay. Well, barium, barium is, oops, is in group, group 2A. So that means, therefore, it likes to be barium two plus. So if it combines with a hydroxide, it's going to combined like this because hydroxide has a charge of minus one. Here we go, barium hydroxide. Let's try another question in the same vein. It says here that given that sodium chloride has the formula NaCl, so we have sodium chloride, and given that magnesium chloride has the formula MgCl2, what's the likely formula of the bromide of boron? Well, remember that sodium is in group 1A. Magnesium is in group 2A. Boron, boron is in group 3A. And so since sodium likes to be Na+, plus, magnesium likes to be Mg2+, plus, boron will like to be boron 3+, plus, like that. So now we have a three positive charge. And bromide, a bromide is a halogen. Bromide always likes to add one electron, one valence electron, so that it can become isoelectronic with a noble gas, which in that case would be krypton. So if we have boron with a three plus charge and bromide with a minus one charge, the formula will have to be BCr3. We'll need three bromides to cancel out the three plus charge on the boron. 
Question 24, titanium can react with chlorine to form titanium tetrachloride, ti or sorry, I should say titanium 4 chloride, titanium 3 chloride, titanium 2 chloride. Which of the following um, formulas represents a compound that you would expect, not expect titanium to form with fluorine? Well, what's the commonality between chlorine and fluorine? If you look at the halogens, halogens, they are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. If they all gain electrons, right, if they all gain one electron, they all become isoelectronic with the neighboring noble gas. So that's why fluorine likes to be F minus one, fluoride, chlorine likes to be Cl minus, which is chloride, bromine becomes bromide, iodine becomes iodide. So the preferred charge of the halogens is minus one. Okay, so now that we've got that, we know that in TiCl4, it must be a four plus charge for titanium. We know here that titanium must have a three plus charge and here it must have a two plus charge. So with that in mind, there's no way we're gonna get titanium with a five plus charge, right? Not gonna happen. It wasn't one of the possibilities that we saw. Whereas we did see titanium with a four plus charge, right? Like it is here, okay? This is a four plus, this is a two plus, and this is a three plus, and we've seen all of those. And so titanium five fluoride is not gonna be a compound that we would expect to form. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. I know I'm not asking you guys a lot of questions today, but I need to get through, I wanna get through all these questions with you. Okay, good, thanks Joel, thanks Kenner, Aurora, Violet, Zira, Alexis, Gang. All right, Melina, thank you, good, perfect. All right, great. Well, let's keep moving on. I promise the second half will go by a lot faster than the first part. Question number 25, it says, mystery element X forms these compounds, XCl3, XOH3, and X2O3. Which of the following groups contains X? Well, who can tell me what the charge on X must be? If you have XCl3, I just told you before that chloride is always minus one. So that tells you that the charge here must be plus three, right? Because chloride is minus one times three equals minus three. Okay, if you have XOH2, hydroxide is a charge of minus one times two. No, sorry. Mr. Dion's losing it. Okay, it should be OH3. There we go, times three equals minus three. So that tells you that it's plus three. Same thing here when we have X2O3, oxygen almost always has a charge of minus two times three gives you minus six. So that means you'd have to have plus six over here, but there's divided by two. So that means that this would be plus three. So that tells you that element X definitely has a plus three charge. What group would it be in? It must be in which group? Not a trick question. It must be in group 3A. That's absolutely right. Perfect, there we go, 3A. They put three, we'll assume it's 3A, and we'll move on with life. Okay, oh, another mystery element. Okay, good, mystery element G reacts with nitrogen to form G3N2. Which of the following compounds doesn't exist? Well, nitrogen, nitrogen is one, two, three electrons away from being isoelectronic with neon. And so nitrogen likes to have a minus three charge. Now, if you have minus three plus times two, that gives you a total of minus six, which tells you that all of this must be equal to plus six, but there's three of them, so that tells you the charge of G is a two plus charge. All right. Now, phosphorus is in the same group as nitrogen. So phosphorus likes to have a three minus charge. So of course, it's going to combine in the exact same manner that it did with nitrogen. So that one's good. We have GF2. Does GF2 make sense to anybody? I'd say yes, it does. Because fluorine always has a charge of minus one. So if you have two of those, that one looks good. The next one is GS. Well, sulfur always has a charge of minus two. So that's going to combine with positive two. I see a major problem with the last one, though. Oxygen always has a charge of minus two, but now you have two Gs, which would give you a total charge of plus four. And that means that overall, this would be a cation with a charge of plus two. And so this is not going to be a formula that we would expect. Question 27 says, what are core electrons? Electrons found in the second shell. 
electrons found in the innermost core, electrons that match the configuration of a noble gas. Remember that whenever we looked at configuration and we backed up to find the number of core electrons? Yes, it was the electrons that match the electron configuration of a noble gas. Question 28 says, what is the frequency of microwave radiation whose wavelength is 1.00 times 10 to the sixth nanometers? Well, we know that microwave radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation, which travels the speed of light. And we know that C, the speed of light, is equal to wavelength times frequency. So based on that, we can solve for frequency, which is equal to C, speed of light, divided by wavelength. So we have our speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we divide this by the wavelength, which is in nanometers, but we need to convert it into meters. How many meters are there in a nanometer? Or how many nanometers are there in a meter? I mean, you could look at it either way, but there are 10 to the 9 nanometers in one meter. OK, so I'm going to put that conversion factor in my denominator. I have a wavelength of 1 times 10 to the 6 nanometers and I know that there are um, one times 10 to the nine nanometers in one meter like that okay so I put this whole thing in here looky looky nanometers cancel out meters cancel out and I end up with reciprocal seconds or seconds to the minus one which is the same thing as a hertz and I end up with an answer that is 3.00 times 10 to the 11 seconds to the minus one. That better be one of the answers. Yes, it's right here. There we have it. So that tells you, you gotta know this formula, all right? And know how to use it. The next one says, which of the following regions of the electromagnetic spectrum has radiation with the lowest, I think it says the lowest frequency, right? I can't see the whole thing. I don't know why I printed it out like that. You tell me, let me back up here. I do have it on my PowerPoint. So yeah, no, I can't see it on that either. Crap, a doodle. Um, does it say lowest frequency? I believe that's what it says. Yeah, I think it's lowest frequency. Anyhow, we'll just I write think that it down. might be energy. It might be what? Energy. Mm, I don't think so. Is it the lowest energy? Hmm, let me go back. I remember taking this, and I'm pretty sure the answer is radio frequency. Okay, so if it's lowest energy, okay, so if it's lowest energy, well, I put here lowest frequency. Let me double check. Shoot. Question. Yeah, you're right. It says lowest energy. So we'll go here. Lowest, lowest energy. All right, there we go. Well, if we think about the energy of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So out of all four of these, the one with the highest energy is going to be the X rays, right? Radio frequency is going to have the lowest energy. And then so we'll put energy is increasing going that way. Then we have visible light and then we have microwaves. And if you're wondering, do I have to know that? Yes. Yes, you should definitely know the order that electromagnetic energy comes in. Um, yes, you should know that. All right, there we go. Um, question number 30. What's the energy of the photon? What's the energy of a photon with a wavelength of 888 picometers? So picometers are 10 to the negative 12 meters. All right. So we have the wavelength and we want to calculate the energy. There's a couple of ways uh, that you could do this. But I think the easiest way is to use our formula. E is equal to HC over lambda. Yeah, I showed you how to derive that equation because we know that E is equal to H times mu, and we know that C is equal to lambda times mu. 
we can solve for mu is equal to C over lambda. And then we just plug that into here, okay? So that's how you get the formula E is equal to HC over lambda. Then we have Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds multiplied by the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. We divide all that spinach by the wavelength, which is 888 picometers. And we know that in one meter, there's 10 to the 12 um, picometers. Okay, like that, look at this. Um, we end up with our uh, picometers canceling out, our meters canceling out, and our seconds canceling out, and we end up with the units of energy, which are joules, and we end up with an energy that is equal to, I did, you know, I got 2.24 times 10 to the negative 16. Negative 16 joules, okay? Is that one of the answers? Yep, there we go. Okay, last 10 questions, there we go. What is the de Broglie wavelength of an electron traveling at a speed of 2.00 times 10 to the six meters per second? And it gives us the mass of the electron. And it also gives us the units of the joule, which are kilograms. Is one joule is one kilogram meters per uh, one kilogram meter squared per second squared. The equation for the de Broglie wavelength is wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by mass multiplied by mu, not mu, u, which is speed. So we have mass and speed. And therefore, all we really need to do is plug the numbers into the equation. We have 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds divided by our mass, which was 9.1094 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms multiplied by our speed, which is 2.00 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. Double check here. We have seconds canceling out like that. We have kilograms meters squared per second squared. Okay, so we end up with, what am I doing wrong here? Yeah, yeah, okay, it works out. All right, so we end up with our wavelength being 3.64 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Like that. Good, everything looks good. And here's the answer like that. Very small wavelength. But remember, it's on the same scale as the size of the electron. Number 32, what does it mean to say that energy is quantized? This is something that we went over in detail, this is when I had my Apple Pencil and I was holding it up in front of the camera and moving it up and down, getting you to close your eyes. And I said that it can only exist in discrete values, right? That's what quantization of energy means. Question 32, it says, what is the frequency of a photon emitted from the hydrogen atom when it relaxes from N is equal to five to an N is equal to one state? For that, we'll use the Rydberg equation, which I provide. If you take a look at the midterm handout, I'll give you the equation. 1 over lambda is equal to um, R multiplied by 1 over N low squared, subtract 1 over N high squared, like that, okay? And when we work this out, we have 1 over lambda is equal to the Rydberg constant, which is 1.0974 times 10 to the 7 meters. It's going to a low state of one, right? This is our high state. It's relaxing. It's going from low, n is equal to five, right? And then it's going down to n is equal to one. So our low is one. One over one squared is one. I know you can do that in your head. And then we have one over five squared, which is one over 25, like that. Okay, so when we punch all that spinach into our calculator, we end up with a wavelength that's equal to 9.49 times 10 to the negative eight meters. And then in order to calculate the frequency, we're gonna use the formula frequency is equal to C over lambda. I went over that a couple of slides ago. So 3.00 times 10 to the eight 
meters per second divided by our wavelength, which is 9.49 times 10 to the negative 8 meters. Meters and meters cancel out, and I'm left over with my frequency in reciprocal seconds, which is the same thing as hertz. Right? Remember, a second to the minus 1 is equal to a hertz. And so I end up with 3.16 times 10 to the 15 hertz. There we go. 3.16 times 10 to the 15 hertz. There we go. All right. The next one is just something that I mentioned in class. It's more of a it's more of a memorization thing. It says, um, what is the meaning of of psi? Um, so you remember the equation, the Hamiltonian? Son of a gun. Where was I? Do you remember the equation? Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian psi is equal to E psi. That was the Schrodinger equation. And then we unpacked the Hamiltonian operator and I said it's this huge differential equation. But what I told you is that this here, this is the wave function, right? Which doesn't really have any meaning, but when we square it, we get the wave equation. And then that tells us the probability of finding an electron of where we would find an electron outside of the nucleus. All right. And so it is the wave function. Okay, that's what psi is. H psi is equal to E psi. Uh, here we go. Get into the quantum numbers. Uh, we're cooking with gas now. Yeah, it says here which value of the quantum number L is possible for the pictured orbital. Well, let me ask you guys a question. I'll ask Gage. Gage, what orbital is this? Or what type of orbital is this? Or anybody. Peanut orbital. That's right, Gage. P for peanut. Gage, I've taught a lot of students, thousands. And you're the first person that's come up with that. Okay. You slap a top hat, monocle, and a cane on that bad boy, and you get yourself Mr. Peanut. All right. The planter's representative. Anyhow, where was I? So you should know that this is a P orbital. Yes, you should know it's a P orbital, right? You should know that an S orbital. S for sphere. See, Gage, I can do it too, right? An S orbital is a, a sphere, the dumbbell. That doesn't look very good, does it? Anyhow, my, Mr. Dion's P orbitals are kind of lacking, aren't they? This is a P orbital. And we saw some different shapes for, P, for D orbitals and F orbitals, but you should know that this is a P orbital. And we said that when L is equal to zero, that's an S orbital. When L is equal to one, that's a P orbital. So that's the answer to the question. When L is equal to two, that's a D orbital. And when L is equal to three, that represents an F orbital. So the quantum number for the P orbital is one. Right there. Okay, good. All right, Gage, I think I'm going to keep that one. P for peanut, the peanut orbital. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, where was I? Which of the following values of the magnetic quantum number ML are allowed when the azimuthal quantum number L equals three? Now, luckily in this, question um this uh, this question wasn't written by me it was actually written by dr oppenheim which none of you have had yet but i'm 90 percent sure he wrote it um when it says the azimuthal quantum number you guys remember i mentioned that very quickly in class one day i said that the, the angular momentum quantum number sometimes it's called the azimuthal quantum number so we'll put here angular angular momentum quantum number now good news is they told you it's l okay they gave you the whole thing okay but it said what are the so basically what it's saying in this question is what are the possible values of ml when l is equal to three right when l is equal to three remember we need to figure out the values of ml okay but we know that when we have n and then we have l the ml values can equal minus l all the way up to zero all the way up to positive l and so the values of ML are going to be minus three, minus two, minus one. Oh, Mr. Dion's getting ahead. My brain is going faster than my bed. It's just slowing me down. Okay, they're one, two, son of a gun. Plus one, plus two, and plus three. Okay, so those are all the possible values of the azimuthal quantum number or the angular momentum, whichever you want to call it. But you know what, you guys? As long as you know the L is equal to, or sorry, ML is equal to minus L all the way up to positive L, you should be good to go. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Yes, no, toaster? All right. 
You're wondering why I say yes, no toaster. It's an expression up in Canada. Whenever you ask somebody in Quebec if they speak English and they don't, they say yes, no toaster. All right. There you go. How many electrons in an atom can have an N, so a principal quantum number, a principal quantum number less than four, and an L is equal to one? Okay, I think I don't like to use the word simple and chemistry together because it's not simple. Okay, well, let's go through this question methodically, and I'll show you why everybody should get 100% on this question. Okay, it says, N has to be less than four. So if we go up to N, if we have N values, we can have zero, one, two, why did I put zero? We can have one, two, three, right? Okay, so those can be our possible values of N. Maybe I should even spread them out even more. One, two, and three, because we're saying less than four. Now, what are my possible values of L? when I have an N equal to one, okay? Or sorry, it says here L is equal to one. What are my possible values of L when my N is equal to one? Remember that L has to be equal to N minus one. So that means that my L here would be zero, right? Sorry, son of a gun, Mr. D. You are high on from zero all the way up to N minus one. So there we go. So for n is equal to one, I can have zero and one. And so that's a possibility. That is not a possibility because there's no such thing because when n is equal to one, L has to be zero. Okay, sorry, I'm getting tired here. Um, the next one, when n is equal to 2, then I can have L value of 0, and I can have an L value of 1, okay? The next one, when n is equal to 3, I can have an L value of 0, 1, and 2, so I can have a value of 1. Okay, good. All right, so we've decided that these two are possible combinations of n and L. So then, how many electrons in an atom can have these quantum numbers. Well, the next thing we'll do is we'll examine ML. Okay, and if I have an L is equal to one, then my ML is going to be equal to minus one, zero, and plus one. My ML here is going to be equal to minus one, zero, and plus one. Each one of these, okay, these all represent an orbital. So that means there's a total of six orbitals. Okay, and if you're like, well, aren't they all P orbitals? Yes, they are. How many electrons can you hold in one orbital? I have a, that's a question. How many, or, how many electrons can you hold in an orbital? Two, exactly. An S orbital can hold two, a P orbital can hold two, a D orbital can hold two, an F orbital can hold two. It's just that there are three types of P orbitals, there are five types of D orbitals, and there are seven types of F orbitals. So we have a total of six orbitals, times two electrons in each one, and that gives us a total of 12 electrons total can be held in all of those orbitals. Sorry, I got kind of muddied up at the beginning here, but it's because I had something scribbled down that I was trying to look at, and I can't read my writing from last spring, so I apologize for that. Okay, which of the following is not a permitted set of quantum numbers for N, L, M, L, and M, S? You know, I'm just going to ask my students, has anybody figured this one out? I'm sure somebody wrote the practice exam and was able to look at one of these and just say, that does not make any sense. Somebody says the first one. Okay. Somebody says the first one. Somebody says the first one. Okay. Mm. What's the problem with the first one? Let me ask you guys. What's the issue with the first one? Uh, I don't see a problem with L being equal to six. No, we've never looked at an L greater than three, but it doesn't mean that L can't keep increasing, right? 
Cal technically can keep keep increasing. That was equal to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, so on and so forth. We haven't discovered all the elements, right? We can keep going. Okay. So yeah, some other people are saying it's the second one. I see a major, major faux pas in the second one. I'll, I'll box it in for you if you're like, where's the major faux pas? It's right here. Right? If L is equal to one, then the only possible values for ML are minus one, zero, and positive one. ML could not be minus two. And so that's the one that's got the problem. Okay? All right. That's a major issue there. Okay, we got a couple questions left. Take a look, question 39, which of the following orbital diagrams is correct for a ground state of nitrogen? You know what, let's just write out the whole electron configuration of nitrogen. Nitrogen has a total of seven electrons, okay? And so we're gonna have one S2, two S2, two P, and if you count over in the P block, it's one, two, three. So it's one S2, two S2, two P3. Let's write out the orbital diagram. So if we have a 1s orbital, a 2s orbital, and then a 2p orbital, there's three types of p orbitals. Let's start filling up. We do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, like that. Remember this rule here, Hunt's rule, the bus rule, Hunt's rule. And so there's, I thought there was one here where they jacked that up. No, nope. anyhow. So the correct answer is this one right here. There's all kinds of funny answers here. I mean, uh, this one has got an electron that was excited to another level. This one doesn't even have the right number of electrons. That doesn't work. This one, I don't know why this electron is pointing down. He's got an identity crisis. This one has too many electrons. So there's all kinds of issues here. Thanks, Gunnar. Good. It's the last one. And let's do it. Let's get to the last question, which is question 40. What's the correct noble gas shorthand ground state electron configuration for the bromide ion? A bromide ion is isoelectronic with krypton. The bromide ion has 36 electrons. Let's get cracking, McGracken. We got bromide. We got 1s2. I know it has for shorthand. I don't care. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. 4s2. What comes after a 4s2, you guys? Not a trick question, but I just want to make sure my students are out there. I am literally staring at a wall on a Friday. Good. Yes. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, Emma. Good. 3d. 3d10. And then 4p. How many 4p electrons do we have in the bromide ion? Yes. Yes. Good. Six, okay? Don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's five. Remember, it's Br minus. There's one extra electron, right? That's how you get a negative charge. Yes, it's 4p6. Now, which ones were the core electrons? Okay, which ones were the core electrons? Well, anything that, any noble gas, that, or the noble gas that precedes bromine, which is argon, okay? And argon has a total of 18 electrons. And so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 12, 18. Boom. Like that. So we have argon, 4s2, 3p10, 4p6. Like that. Is that one of the answers? What's the question asking? I think I'm reading it wrong. What is the correct noble gas shortening? Where is the electron to be? Um, I see what they're getting at here. They want us to, is this the correct answer that it gives in the practice exam? Is Krypton? I bet you that's what it is. Let me double check. <laughs> do, do, do. Uh, 
Yeah, I see. In the practice exam, I don't know what's going on with my practice exam. Let me just double check one thing. Can you give me a second here? I want to look at one thing. I mean, it's okay. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of doing this. Uh, no, I'm looking at the wrong exam. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just give me two shakes of a lamb's tail here. I just want to address this with my students before I sign off. Da -da -da. Take a look here. Okay, let's go. Yeah, okay, so they're saying it's just Krypton. Okay, which is which is cool. I'm not a big fan of doing that, of taking a noble gas that lands on the exact same number of electrons. Not a big fan of that. But I guess since there isn't in since this isn't an answer, this one that I've written out here, this is the only one that fits, okay? Because it has a total of 36, has a total of 36 electrons. Yeah, that's fine the way it's written. All right. 